Wali umelito bwana siwezi kueleza uli ni fia msalabani kwa sababu ya pendo lako nisiye kuwa wamana umenifanya kuwa wadhamani usifiwe umenitendea maku utukuzwe nda lako liku umbali umelito bwana siwezi ku Eleza uli ni fia msalabani kwa sababu ya pendo lako nisiye kuwa wamana umenifanya kuwa wadhamani usifiwe umenitende ama ku utukuzwe jinda lako liku na mini taimba sifo za ku koote kwa kila lugha taifa na jamaa wasikie ili wote waamini o wasipote bali wapate uzima wa milele na mimi taimba sifa za kwa kote kwa kila lugha taifa na jamaa wasikie ili wote waamini o wasipote going to ask if you'd open your Bibles, if you have them with you, to the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew, the 43rd, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, and we will read verses 43 through 45. That's Matthew, the 12th chapter, verses 43 through 45. The Bible says, but the unclean spirit, when he is gone out of the man, passeth through the waterless places, seeking rest, and findeth it not. Then he saith, I will return into the house whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more evil than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man becometh worse than the first. Even so shall it be also to this evil generation. For the next few moments, if you will, I would like for us to consider the subject, Hey, 
Ho, devil, you got to go. Hey, ho, devil, you've got to go. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. I praise God for this opportunity to stand before you. I ask God now that you would once again hide me behind the cross. May you be seen high and lifted up. May your voice be heard, your spirit be felt. May your word find a lodging place. May some man, some woman, some boy, some girl, some young person under the sound of my voice have an encounter with you, a fresh encounter with you. May their lives forever be, may their hearts forever be touched and their lives forever be changed. And Father God, when the call is given for someone to surrender their life to God, may they move today, for today is the acceptable hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Many of us know the Genesis account of our parents, Adam and Eve, and how they chose to obey Satan rather than obey God. After Satan had deceived one-third of the angelic host to follow him, his next target became human beings. When he watched Adam and Eve being created, he most assuredly thought that they were the strangest creatures he had ever seen. They were made in God's image and had a capacity for fellowship with God that not even the angels possessed. Right from the beginning, Satan knew he would do everything possible to get them to side with him in his attack on God. Adam and Eve differed from angels in another way. They could reproduce through procreation. They could multiply by sexual union rather than being individually created. Their offsprings would be bound together through blood and have mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters and cousins. Their, their solidarity had far-reaching implications for Satan and his mission. And so when the angels sinned, they did so individually. The decision of one angel did not directly affect the decision of another. Thus, one-third of the angels could side with Lucifer and two-thirds retain their living and loving relationship with God. But that's not the case with human beings. If Adam and Eve were to sin, they would not only contaminate themselves, but they would contaminate their offsprings. Standing at the head of the race, these would be parents had the awesome responsibility of making a decision that for good or ill would affect the whole course of human history. Little wonder did Satan take special interest in these strange creatures. Satan was there and heard the instructions given to Adam and Eve by God. From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. They could eat of every tree in the garden except one, just one. Amid all of the thousands of yeses, there was just one no. Satan waited for the right moment to make his move. He considered his options. The time of the temptation and the means he would use were all important. This was one opportunity he could not miss. The unfallen angels warned Adam and Eve to be on their guard against the devices of Satan. And while they were obedient to God, the evil one could not harm them. For if need be, every angel in heaven would be sent for their help. The tree of knowledge had been made a test of their obedience, of their love to God. 
We too have a test. Satan was not to follow them with continual temptation. He could only have access to them at the forbidden tree. Nowhere else in the garden could Satan tempt them. Wouldn't it be nice that if we could walk all over the campus and there was just one place in all of Kenya that Satan would be able to tempt us. As long as we didn't go to that one place, Satan had no access to us. That's how it is with Adam and Eve. And in order to accomplish his work unperceived, Satan chose to employ as his medium the serpent, a disguise well adapted for the purposes of deception. Satan, you see, does not use the grotesque and hideous figure that he is. Uh, rather, Satan is metamorphic, if you will. He likes to appear under the auspices of good. He is, as he's introduced in Genesis, the most crafty and subtle of creatures. He is the quintessential con artist wor working his schemes viva camouflage. The serpent was then one of the wisest and the most beautiful creatures on earth. He had wings. I was over in the snake park and looking at the, the snakes yesterday, uh, and, and, and can you imagine that uh, at creation, the snake had wings, and while flying through the air, he presented an appearance of dazzling brightness, having the colors and brilliancy of burnished gold. Resting in the rich, laden branches of the forbidden tree and regaling itself on in delicious fruit, it was an object to attest or to arrest the attention and delight of the eye of the beholder. You have to remember the, the snake was beautiful before the fall. And as we stand here in, the, uh, in here in 2019, it is important that we understand that Satan uses the same modus operandi on us. While the story of Adam and Eve comes to us from the ancient past, it is up to date as the temptations you faced last night. The scene has changed, but the methodology has not. Many of us, like Eve, allow the devil to come into our lives because we do not recognize him. The tempter always comes to us in a disguise. When he came to Eve, he did not come as a creature of ugliness. Uh, uh, there was nothing that made Eve feel alarmed. When the devil comes to you, he does not come in the form of some coiled snake. Uh, he does not approach with the roar of a lion. He does not come waving a red flag. Satan simply slides into your life. Listen. The devil shows up at church. He usually shows up earlier than most of us. He picks up the bulletin and he sees where he can have his time. He comes to every board meeting, every business meeting, every choir practice. The devil is for real, my young people, and he's out to disrupt the cause of God. So not only does Satan lie to us, uh, by coming to us in a disguise, but he lies to us about who God is. The first time Satan opens his mouth is to put a question where God put a period. His first desire is to pervert Adam and Eve's opinion about God. He paints God as mean and uncaring. You can read it in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Satan asks a question. Indeed, has God said, ye shall not eat from the tree of the garden? Notice Satan used a sincere motive to tempt Eve. He says, God knows that when you eat of the tree, you will become like God. 
to become more like God is the biggest goal of humanity. It is what we are supposed to do. But Satan misled Eve on the right way to accomplish that goal. Matter of fact, he was lying. You remember the Bible says that Adam and Eve were already made in the image of God. So they were already in the image of God. So God wasn't afraid that they would be like him because he made them like him. God, God, he says, listen, God is deceiving you. He is hiding the real reason he does not want you to eat this so-called forbidden tree. He, if you eat it from it, you'll be like the Almighty himself. This is what the devil is telling him. He wants the glory. He doesn't want you. He doesn't want what's best for you. Satan wanted Eve to believe that God is strict stingy and selfish for not wanting Eve to share in the knowledge of good and evil. The one who comes to deceive charges God with deception. Satan lies about himself, making himself appear to be harmless. Then he lies about God, making God appear harmful. Satan made Eve forget all that God had given her and got her to focus her attention on all but the one thing she could not have. She could go anywhere in the garden. She could eat from any tree in the garden. And he took her eyes off of all of that and focused in on one tree. Now think about it. Can I ask you a question? If you could eat from any tree on this campus, if these trees all bore fruit and you could eat from any one, but say, let's just pretend that this is a tree. So you could go anywhere on campus to any tree. You could eat from any tree on campus. God says, just stay away from this one. Don't touch it. Don't eat from it. Don't do anything with it. How many think they could do that? How many of you think you could do that? Stay away from this one tree, but all the other trees. None of you all could do it? How many of you think? Come on, if you think you could stay away from this tree and not, and but you had access to every other tree out here, do you think you could do that? Well, isn't that easy? That's pretty easy. Well, God says, let me tell you how hard it is. God says, you got six days to do your thing. I've set aside one day, the Sabbath, a 24-hour time period. The other six days, you know, you can, you're not free to just do anything, but it's your day. You can do that. And, 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 and you got six days out of seven, and we have a hard time keeping the Sabbath. God says, listen, I give you a dollar. And for every dollar, you can keep 90 cents. I just want you to give me 10 back. The test is the same, y'all. It was the tree for Adam and Eve. It's the Sabbath for us. It's the tithe for us. And so if you, I'm glad a lot of you are back home. Everybody raises their hand in my home church. Uh, but, but I'm glad you didn't do it. You may, you may know something that we don't know back home. Because if you can't keep the Sabbath, if you can't be faithful in returning tithe to the Lord, you would have went to the tree too. But God says, look, it's not just teenagers and young people who think uh, that God is a God of rules. God says, I want you to stay away from it because I don't want you to suffer the consequences that come with eating from the tree. Listen, God says, I'm trying to protect you. That's why I put the Sabbath in place. I'm trying to bless you. That's why the principle of tithe is in place. God is not trying to keep any good thing away from us. The problem with us is we put too much emphasis on what we can't do, too much emphasis on what we can't 
eat, too much emphasis on what we can't drink and what we can't wear, and, and, and that becomes the thrust of our ministry. But God is not a God of the negative. God is a God of positive. Too much time on what we're against. It is clear from Jesus' ministry that, that attention needs to be put on what Jesus did do. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in jail, you visited me. When did you do this? When you did it for the least of them, you were doing it for me. Jesus says, listen, stop focusing in on all the negative. I've come to give you life everlasting, freedom, fullness in God. I've come to give you affirmation of life, celebration of living, quickening of the mind, sanctification, total commitment, a vision of the eternal, blessed assurance, God is for us, Jesus won't fail us, and the Holy Spirit won't leave us. That's positive, not negative. Serving God is not a rigid rehearsal of what you can't do and can't have. It is a commendable celebration of what you do have and what you can do through him. For the fruit of the Spirit is not nastiness and bitterness and hatred, meanness or cold. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Peace, kindness, goodness, long-suffering, gentleness. It's positive, not negative. Let's go back to the creature, the serpent. The serpent was more subtle, the Bible says, than any beast of the field. The translation is clear. The smartest creature after man was the serpent. Hmm. Give the devil credit. He does not choose to use dummies. He chose the most outstanding creation after mankind. The most subtle, the craftiest, and the most beautiful of them all, and asked for access. See, the only way the devil can use you is you give him permission. Hmm. And so for his agreement to be used, he's included in a curse. Oh, yes, you need to understand that if you believe the devil's lies and obey him, there is a price you must pay. Now, before we, we, we go any further, it's important that I disabuse you of the thought that the only thing that the serpent lost in Eden was wings. You do know the certain serpent used to fly. Notice what the Bible, what the inspired writer says in the book Story of Redemption. It says the serpent was beautiful and had wings. She goes on to say that he did not crawl upon the ground on his belly, but went from place to place in the air and ate fruit like a man. Satan entered the serpent and took its place in the tree of knowledge of good and evil and leisurely ate the fruit. The Bible backs this up. You can read Isaiah 14, uh, 29 and Isaiah 36. In Isaiah 36, if you put that up for him, it says, the burden of the beast of the south into the land of the trouble and anguish from whence Come the young and the old lion, the viper and the flying fiery serpent. Serpents, snakes used to fly. So after God hears Adam and Eve's lame excuses, Adam saying she did it and Eve saying the serpent did it, God pronounces a curse. You, Sister Eve, She'll have pain in childbirth. Sisters, mothers out there who wonder why you go through so much pain, it's because Eve sinned. But listen to this. This is the one that got me. Hear me, ladies. You Not only will you 
have pain in childbirth, but you shall be inclined to mankind even when they mistreat you. Some of you sisters, why you can't get away and why you say, well, I just love him. It's here in the Bible. He treats you wrong. He don't pay you no attention. I just love him. Yeah, the Bible says you're going to be inclined to mankind. You blame that on Mama Eve. She got you into this. But you, Adam, you will till the soil, and it shall have thorns and thistles, and by the sweat of your brow you will eat. Men, you now have to work hard. But you, the snake, here's what he says to the snake. After all I did for you. You fly, you're smart, you chew like a man, you can speak in conversation. But why would the devil choose a creature that could not speak? It says he talked to Eve. They had a conversation. Now before you look at me strange, saying animals don't talk. Well, how many of you have ever heard a parrot talk? Mm -hmm. There's many types parrots, they talk by mimicking. So it would be illogical to think that God didn't have the ability to give this to other animals. Especially, we're talking about in a perfect world. There is no sin. Speaking human sounding words and speaking intelligent, however, is not the same. We know from the Bible that God caused Balaam's donkey to talk. Mm. Because there's no other place in the Scripture that reveals Satan or demons can cause animals to speak, it makes sense that the serpent could make the sound capable of speech, and Satan used this to his advantage. In essence, Satan likely used the feature that the original serpent had and caused it to say what he wanted. Remember, Satan can only use you if you give him access. Although this may sound far-fetched, there should be caution about limiting what God did or didn't do in a perfect garden. I just, in my sanctified imagination, I believe that there's no way that the snake would have started talking to Eve and not startled her if the snakes could not talk. Remember, snakes could fly. Yet God, with all that beautiful creation wasted, said to him, you will now crawl on your belly. Give me your wings and you will fly no more. I would like to suggest to you that that was only the beginning. I've, I'm a hit, I'm a, I'm a, I like watching National Geographic and all of that. And, and when I went into the snake park yesterday, it kind of brought all this back to me. So I did some research, and I would like to suggest to you uh, that, that wings was not only thing that the snake lost. For you must understand that in order for a creature to fly, scientists say they must have lungs. It must have something to help it rise in the air. So the serpent must have begun with two lungs. Herpetologists suggest that if you look at a snake now, they have lungs if, if they have lungs at all, they have an elongated right lung, and the left lung has shrunken and been pushed to the side. So now the ballast is gone, for when God took back the wings, he took back the power to fly. This creature no longer needed to rise, for it would now crawl on its belly. For something to be able to fly, it must have some landing gear. Amen? It is every reason to believe that snakes had legs. Not only wings, but legs. All vertebrates that live on land, from humans to alligators to birds, are collectively known as tetrapods, meaning four feet. 
The name sticks even though the legs to which two of these feet are attached have become arms in humans and wings in birds. In snakes, the change was even more radical. They lost all four of their limbs. Uh, one of the few remaining signs of their limb heritage is the presence of a vestigial hip imprisoned in the rib cage. When scientists look at larger snakes now, they see spurs near the tail that they say are the remains of legs. You see, when God says, I'm going to curse you, his curse is all-encompassing. So there are no more legs. Give me your wings. Give me your legs. If a creature is going to fly, it makes sense that he must see. If creature is going to fly, uh, you can't go through the air quickly and not see where you're going. So it's evident that a snake at one point could see at a long distance. The snake could see clearly everything that was before him. God took back his eyesight so that even now a snake can see things that move, but if you stand still, he can't see. A snake has eyes that are pushed out to to see things at long distance, but can't see what's right in front of them because the eyesight is no longer needed. Give me back your wings. Give me back your eyes. But the snake no longer has ears. I mean, it says that him and Adam, him and Eve had a conversation. In order to have a conversation, you must have some ears to listen. There's no opening for the ears so the snake can barely make out what's going on. However, there is traces of an apparatus for hearing inside of their heads, and that setup is attached to their jawbone. If you can't fly, if you can't see, you don't need to hear. And we know that snakes no longer had a voice. And if now all that a snake can do is once could carry on a conversation. The snake was more subtle. That means it was had some intelligence, uh, but now scientists try to measure a snake's intelligence, they get a flat line. All this happened because God cursed it. Now, my brothers and sisters, God could have destroyed the snake. But I declare to you today that the snake did not destroy, God did not destroy the snake because he left a message for you and me. Here it is. When you allow the devil to use you, you can't fly no more. Bible says we shall take up wings like eagles, but if you allow the devil to use you, you will not fly. When you let the devil use your mind, you won't be able to think on the things that God has called you to think on. He says, what so, says think on these things, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is of good report. But if you allow the devil to use you, you will not be able to think Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. When you let the devil use you, you can't take the truth of God, but the word, but you no longer have teeth on it and digest it. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. David said that the word was sweeter than honey. When you let the devil use you, you cannot hear the voice of God anymore. And when you let the devil use you, you can't see clearly anymore. You become blind to the things of God. And when you let the devil use you, your legs won't take you where God intends for you to go in the path of righteousness. My brothers and sisters, you need to know the devil is angry. He's mad. He's busy. The Bible says he has come down with great wrath, for he knows his time is short. The Bible says in our scripture reading, Matthew 12, 43 through 45, that a man, a woman, cleaned her house. She got all of the demons out, but she left the house empty. After a while, the demons came back. 
saw that the house was empty and went and got his friends and brought seven more. Listen, my friends, it's not enough to put the devil out. You must put Jesus in. The text seems to suggest that if we do not make the effort to fill our homes with good things, then evil things are likely to return with a vengeance. We're expected to fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit. Through faith, Christ Jesus himself will dwell in us. What do we fill our hearts with? We can fill our hearts with God's peace. We can fill our hearts with God's law. David said that he has written God's law on his heart. We're to sanctify ourselves. How do we, the principle, we are to become sanctified, the Lord God in your hearts. The word sanctified means to be set apart. Set a special place in your heart for God the ruler of your life. How do I do it? How do I become sanctified? How do I allow Jesus to come on the inside? You've got to utilize every opportunity to study God's Word. Study the Word of God. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Allow yourself to be filled with the Spirit of God. Sing at church. Sing the songs of Zion at church and at home, in the car. Sing alone. Sing with others. Let you the, Another way, you got to let the mind of Christ dwell in you. Be careful what you watch. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful of your conversation. Choose your friends wisely. We want to have Jesus in. Hey, whole devil, you got to go? Yes, but Jesus, you've got to come in. Holy Spirit, you've got to come in. Devil out? Yes, but a new song in. Devil out? Yes, but joy in. Devil out? Yes, but prayer in. Devil out, yes, but Bible in. Devil out, yes, but church attendance in. Devil out, yes, but witnessing in. Devil out, yes, but let Jesus come into your heart. Somebody here tonight, today, needs to make the decision that I am going to put the devil out. See, there can be where there is light, there can be no darkness. So if you want the darkness out of your life, then you need to allow the light to control your life. Put the devil out. Stomp the devil out. Listen, he says we're more than victors through Christ Jesus. We're planning a baptism in two days. There are young people under the sound of my voice who need to make the decision to follow Jesus all the way. You're simply saying devil out. Our theme is to expect greater. Throughout this week, we have, we've been talking to you. If you want to expect greater, you need to know the will for your life. If you want to expect greater, you need to put the devil out. If you want to, if you're going to expect and you want greater in your life, you've got to learn how to endure the pain and stay faithful to God. You want to expect greater in your life? I've come by here to tell you it all begins with giving your life to God. Day after day, you've been hearing these messages. What are you going to do with it? It's not enough just to hear the Word of God. You've got to take action. You say you love God. Gee, God says, listen, I gave you an example of love. It says, for God so loved the world. He didn't stop there. He says, listen, I love the world so much I did something. I gave my only begotten Son. And God is saying to us, you love me, I want you to do something. I want you to give me your life. I gave my son to the world, and I want the world to give their life to me. I don't know where you are. I don't know who you are. 
I don't know what you're going through. None of that matters. What matters is will you give your life to Jesus? Don't be afraid. Don't sit here and allow pride and, 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 and shyness and all of that stop you from making the best decision you'll ever make in your life. Somebody here today needs to give their life to Jesus. Somebody needs to publicly stand and say, I give my life to Jesus and I want to be baptized. If that's you today, won't you take the stand? I don't know if you're in this section, somebody needs to stand to say, I'll be baptized. I don't know how it's done, uh, but I'm just straightforward. Don't need to beat around the bush. Don't need to get you to raise your hand, then get you to stand, then get you to come down. Come on, if you want to give your life to Jesus, if God has been good to you and you want to say, Lord, today I give you my life, I want to be baptized. I want to make my calling and election sure. I just don't want to go to a church, uh, to a Christian school, get an education, hear about you from one spiritual week of emphasis to another, and then when the end comes, never have made the decision to say yes to you. Where are you? Somebody needs to take a stand. Is there yet but one who will say, Jesus, all to Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. Is there somebody bold enough? Is there somebody brave enough? Is there some woman, some boy, some man, some woman, some girl who is willing to say yes? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? I know you're in here. I know you're in here came all the way from the United States of America to give you this opportunity. Do not let it pass. This is the best decision that you can ever make. Jesus is walking up and down these aisles right now. He's calling someone to come. You know the story of Lazarus. It says Lazarus was a wee little man. Jesus was walking up and down the street city with everybody. Lazarus wanted to see Jesus so bad that he went to a sycamore tree and climbed up in the sycamore tree. The Bible last Jesus was walking by and stopped, looked up and said, Lazarus, you come down for I must go to your house today. So it's just like he of Jerusalem are walking the aisles of this church right now. You may be in the balcony. You may be outside. Wherever you are, you need to make the decision right now. Somebody needs to take a stand. Somebody needs to say yes. Jesus wants to go home with you. Don't make the mistake of thinking you have to have your life all together. You have to have it all straightened out. No, Jesus says, if you bring me home with you, I'll straighten out what you need to get straightened out. I'll take care of it. Whatever needs to be put in your house, I'll put it out. Whatever needs to be cleaned up in your house, I'll clean it up. I just need you to take me home with you. I must go home with you. Somebody, thank you, praise the Lord. There's others. Don't stop. Come on. I live in Cleveland, Ohio. Many of you may have heard of the man named LeBron James. I'll never forget a few years ago, he was a free agent the first time. They had a big thing. Who was LeBron going to sign with? What team was he going to take his talents to? It was a big thing. He got on television. They had a special. And while he was on television, LeBron finally made the announcement. I'm going to take my talents to Miami. I'm going to take talents to Miami. And people rejoiced in Miami and people were sad 
in Cleveland. Well, I got a better. Right now, you're a free agent. If you haven't given your life to Jesus, you're a free agent. All of heaven, the angelic hosts, are looking over the balcony of heaven right now. And they're waiting on you to make a decision. Who will you give your talents to? Will you give them to Team Jesus or will you give them to the devil? Who will you give your talents to? When you stand for Jesus, you're telling the devil, I'm taking my talents to the kingdom. I'm joining up with King Jesus. That's whose team I want to be a part of. I don't know who you are, praise the Lord, young lady. Who you are, but you want to stand right now and say, I'm taking my talents. I'm joining Team Jesus. The choice is yours. The Bible says all of heaven rejoices over one. Don't you want to make heaven rejoice? Take your stand. Won't you come? Won't you move? You're not doing it for me. You're not doing it for the pastor. You're not doing it for anybody but Jesus. Jesus went to Calvary's cross just for you. And he's only asking you right now, will you make the decision to be baptized for me? What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? What's holding you back? giving your life to the one who loves you like no one else loves you? Why would you delay in giving your life to Jesus? I mean, uh, you know your story. Some of you are going through things that are unimaginable. Why don't you try Jesus? Why don't you try? Your life can't get anything but better. But I promise you, if you give your life to Jesus, what I can't promise you is that your troubles will go away. What I can promise you is Jesus will be with you in the midst of all of your troubles. He will, and there will be a peace that we talked about that passeth all understanding. Is there another? My time is almost up. You have class to go to. You have studies to do. I want to praise God for these who have come down, but I know there's somebody else. And my goal, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, for the next, I have tonight, I have Friday morning, I have Friday night, and I have Sabbath morning. I'm just going to put it out there. My objective is to make anybody who has not given their life to Jesus as uncomfortable as I can until they come and stand right here. So I'm telling you. Because why am I doing it? Because I want you to experience the best thing that could ever happen in your life. And that is to give your life to Jesus. If you're in the balcony. You're not too far away. You can stand to your feet. You can make your way down here. You can stand to your feet and we'll come up to you. Jesus did it for you. 20 seconds. It's crunch time. It's prime time. This is the most important part of the game. It's 20 seconds left. I'm not going to prolong it anymore. 15 seconds. 10. 8. 7. 6. 5. 4. 3. 2. One, God, we rejoice over these, your children, who have come. We thank you for their decision, their boldness, their courageousness to come and stand before all these people declaring, I give my life to Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus all the way. Now, Father God, in this vast audience that sits before me, 
there are at least 50 to 100 more who need to make a decision. Lord, may your spirit make them as uneasy and as unsettled that you can until they say yes. Don't give them peace until they say yes to you. Don't let them rest until they say yes for you because their eternal destiny lays in the balance right now. Into your hands, I commend them. Do what only you can do. I will do my part, preach the gospel, open the doors of the church. Holy Spirit, I'm depending on you to make a move. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus, that all those who love him say, amen and amen.